Uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you for that very overly kind introduction. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, waves and resonance, starting with musical instruments, uh, ending with vacuum cleaners, and taking in some rather strange things in between. So I, I want to start with um, my guitar and think about what happens when I play one of the strings on it. It's my A string. So you all hear the nice sound it makes. Uh, I want to think about what the string is doing, first of all. So this is roughly what my A string would be doing when I pluck it around about a third of the way down. And you see it's quite a complicated motion. Uh, it's periodic, it's repeating. Um, but we find it very convenient uh, mathematically to try and break up this complicated motion into a series of things which are a bit simpler. So I can describe that, uh, the motion at the top, just by adding together uh, the three disturbances that you see below. So if I sum these three together, then I get the top motion. This is known uh, mathematically as an eigenmode uh, decomposition. And for guitar strings, anybody who's uh, used to, um, uh, who plays an instrument or has been involved in music will understand that the, the first mode on the left there is the fundamental mode of this guitar string, and the one in the middle is the first harmonic, and the one at the right is the, um, the second harmonic. And then there would be a series of increasing harmonics that oscillate more and more quickly, um, and, but the amplitude typically decays, as I've shown it here, that uh, most of the energy is in the first, and then a little bit more energy in the second, etc. Uh, so the first thing I want to show you is how uh, how you generate these. So how did I draw those? So imagine I have uh, a wave. This is my sinusoidal wave going up and down at the top here. Um, so it's a repeating sinusoidal pattern. And I've called lambda is the wave length. So that's the, the minimal repeating unit. So in this case, you can think of it as the distance between two peaks is the wavelength. And in each of those modes, well, so my string is, is pinned at the end point, so it's not allowed to vibrate at the ends. And so to generate a mode, I have to choose a segment of this wave in which the, the, I go through zero at each end. So I can choose any two zeros to do that. The simplest or the shortest uh, choice would be to choose two neighboring zeros. And if I do that, then I get a wave which just has one hump, and that gives me the fundamental. And so you can see by comparing how much of a, of a wavelength that I get here that I only got half a wavelength in, in between my, the two endpoints of my string. The, the next thing I could do is I could skip a zero. So I could choose not the next zero, but the one after that. And that would give me the first harmonic. And in that case, I managed to get a full wavelength in between the two endpoints of my string. So the wavelength of, of this wave uh, is half of that of the, of the fundamental. And of course, the next one, I just skip another zero. So I choose, I skip two, and I choose uh, um, this segment of the wave front. That gives me the second harmonic. And in this case, I managed to get uh, one and a half times the wavelength in between the two endpoints. So because the length of my string is fixed, in order to get more and more of these waves in there, I have to reduce the wavelength, so that the wavelength of each mode is getting successively smaller. So this one is, uh, the wavelength is half of this one, this one is a third of the fundamental. So that's how I, I generate the, I work out what the wavelength of these modes is. You probably noticed that they were all oscillating at different frequencies as well. So the formula for the frequency of one of these waves is that it's uh, it's inversely proportional to the wavelength. So the smaller the wavelength, the bigger the frequency. And the constant there, C, is the speed at which waves uh, propagate on the string. So that depends on how tight the string is. If I change the tension, I change C. It depends on what it's made of, whether it's metal or nylon. Uh, and it depends on how thick it is, for example. But for each of these modes, C would be a constant. So the way the frequency changes between modes is all down to whether, how the wavelength is changing. So from this formula, I could work out what the frequency of the fundamental is. And then because the wavelength of the first harmonic 
is half that of the fundamental, that tells me that the frequency is going to be double that of the fundamental. So whatever I got for omega 1, the frequency of the first harmonic is going to be twice the frequency of the fundamental. And for the next harmonic, the wavelength goes down again, so it's, it's a third of the fundamental, and therefore the frequency is three times the fundamental. So the string I played <coughs> corresponded to uh, A2, so this is the musical notation in which middle C is C4, and so the uh, two is sort of two octaves below that, and it's the A of that um, scale. And that has got a frequency of 110 hertz, that string. So on a piano, it would be this key here. And so the, the first harmonic, I double the frequency. So that would get me to 220 hertz. And that corresponds to going up by an octave. And so that would be this key there on the piano. The same A, but an octave higher. The, for the next harmonic, I have three times the frequency. So that would be 330 hertz. And that's an E. That's E4 here, the E above middle C. So from that formula, you can see that, that long strings have uh, lower frequencies, that each higher mode is, uh, is an integer multiple of the fundamental. So I, I start with the fundamental, and then I have two times the frequency, and then three times, etc. And whenever I double the frequency, I raise the pitch by an octave. Uh, so now, it's always dangerous to do things live, but I'm going to try and switch. Ah, there we go. And show you that uh, this is really true. So in the old days, I'd have had to bring loads of equipment in here to show you what frequency my guitar is playing. These days, you just go into the App Store and download an app for it. So this is my phone here, which... decided to die. Oh, come on. Let's try again. Oxford Wave Research. Right, there we go. So, it's, uh, it's giving you frequency on the horizontal axis, and it's giving you how much energy there is at that frequency on the vertical axis in decibel. So it's a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. So if I play my A string, you should see it. Uh, I said it was uh, 110. If I stop talking so that you can see the guitar. So you see the peak at the far left, 110 would be about here. And you see that the fundamental is at 110, and then you see a lot of harmonics over the top of that. Now, if I, if I touch the string in the middle when I'm playing this, that kills the fundamental, because the fundamental wants to vibrate in the middle, but it doesn't kill any even harmonic, because all the even harmonics had a zero in the middle. So if I play the string and touch it in the middle, I get every second harmonic. So and I can do the same thing. If I touch it a third of the way down, then I get every third harmonic. So. It doesn't matter whether I do it a third here, or I could do it a third down here. The tone that you get out of it depends on the ratio of the, of the harmonic. So how much is in the fundamental and how much is in the other mode. So if I play the string somewhere near the middle, I get a lot of the fundamental, not much of the harmonics. And you can see that, as soon as I talk, you can't see, but you can see that there's a large peak. It's a logarithmic scale, remember. So there's a large peak on the left, and it decays quite rapidly as I go down. That's a nice round note. If I play down this end, I generate a lot more of the harmonics and much less of the fundamental. And you see it's a much tinnier sound. I'm 
I'm trying to generate it so that there's the same amount of energy in the fundamental. Right. Let me see. Pause that. Perfect. So that's all sort of uh, by way of warm up, really. That uh, strings are nice and easy to visualize, but uh, what I really want to talk to you about is pipes. Um, so pipes uh, behave in, in a similar sort of way, and I still have waves that go up and down them. So for the guitar, the speed of the wave depended on what the string was made of. For pipes, it depends on what the stuff inside the pipe is made of. So in particular, if I've got air in my pipe, which is the norm, uh, the speed of the wave depends on the compressibility of the air and the density of the air. And so I just write that up here because we'll come back to it later. So here is my diagram of, of pipes. So uh, let me try and explain what's going on here first. So just at the moment, just think about the top row. So what's happening in, uh, whereas a guitar, the wave is a transverse wave. So the, um, the displacement of the string is at right angles to the string. Whereas for a pipe, the air molecules shuttle back and forwards along the pipe. And so it's a longitudinal wave, and that makes it harder to draw. Um, so what I'm plotting at the top here is actually the pressure. So this is the pressure that the air would feel, uh, of the air inside the pipe. And you can recognize the modes that I had for my guitar, but they're just in terms of the pressure now. Underneath, uh, I'm showing you the, the color here is the density. So the pressure and the density are proportional to each other. So when I have high pressure, I have high density, and I'm coloring that blue. And when I have low pressure, I have low density, and I'm coloring that white. And then I'm also showing you a few representative air molecules. And because the more molecules there are, the more dense the air is. So there are more dots in the dense region than there are in the not dense region. So now let me, this is an animation. Now I've explained what the bits are. I can show you what waves look like in a pipe. So you can see the molecules shuttle backwards and forwards. And as they do, the pressure goes up and down and the density goes up and down. But the modes that you get are exactly the same at the top as I had for my guitar. So, the, so first I should explain what this picture is as well. So you, you've always got to have some mouthpiece or something to actually generate the disturbance in a pipe, the sort of equivalent of my finger on the guitar string. And so this bit at the end here is, that's just the mouthpiece. You should think of the pipe as being from this hole here to the end here. And typically, uh, there's a hole here uh, and at this is a pipe which is open at the end. And so at this end, the pressure has got to be equal to whatever it is atmospherically. So that the pressure perturbation has to be zero here. And at this end, it also is zero. So that's exactly like the guitar string, that the pressure has to vanish at either end. And I get exactly equivalent modes. But with pipes, I can also, I could close the end of the pipe. Uh, I could put a stop in here. And if I put a stop in the end of the pipe, that means, so you see that the, the air molecules here keep shuttling in and out at the side. Well, that stops that happening here. And that means that instead of uh, having a, the pressure equal to atmospheric, uh, so instead of the pressure perturbation being zero, then it should be a maximum or a minimum there, because it says I'm not allowing the air to go, so you end up cutting this wave at its peak. And so you can see that. Uh, this is, as, as I had before, I have half a wavelength in here, and then I have a full wavelength, and then I have uh, one and a half. Here I've got a quarter of the wavelength in there only. And then the first harmonic, the next one I've got three quarters, and then I've got five quarters. So that tells you, if I translate that into frequencies, uh, if, suppose this pipe was such that the fundamental frequency was 220 hertz, then we've already seen that uh, the higher harmonics would be integer multiples of the first. So this would be double, so that corresponds to going up an octave, and this would be times by three, which corresponds to going up another fifth. If I take a pipe the same length and I close the end, then I've changed the wavelength and I've reduced it by half, because I only get a quarter of a wavelength in now. 
So the wavelength is four times the length of my pipe, not just two times the length. So that tells me the frequency goes down by a half, which tells me the note goes down by an octave. So the closed pipe has a lower note by an octave. And the first harmonic is three times that. So the first harmonic is actually E4, not A3. And then the next harmonic is five times it. OK, let me switch back and see if I can demonstrate that. Um, I've got a few toys that I bought online here. Let me sh first show you that, uh, that the length of the pipe de determines the note. So it's a closed pipe. And as I change the length, the note goes up. Let me change the scale on here, because th this is obviously much um, it's a much higher note than my guitar string, so I have to, to change this. Let's go to 2,000. So, uh, this was the closest I could get to a pipe. It really is cylindrical. I've, uh, it's an Irish tin whistle. I've sellotaped up all the holes, because I couldn't do all the holes at the same time as everything else. So if I blow it, it really is just a, an open pipe of this length. It says on it that it's a D, and I think that means... That's better. You, you, not to blow too hard. If you blow too hard, you end up getting the higher harmonics, and it sounds awful. Uh, so I think it's around about 600 hertz, this. And you can see that the harmonics are at 1,200 and 1,800, right? You're really getting one, two, three. Right. Now I'm going to put my finger over the end and try again. Now, it's designed to be an open-ended pipe, this. So as soon as I put my finger over the end, the mouthpiece is not really right for this, and it's... It's quite hard to get it to go at the fundamental. If I just blow without thinking about it, I'm going to hit the first harmonic. It sounds like it went up, right? I told you it should go down. It's because I'm hitting the first harmonic. And you can see that I am because I'm getting 900. If I blow really gently, I can get 300. Are you convinced? <laughs> OK, so you can just see that you get 300, and then you get 900, and then you get 1,500, right? One, three, five. Let me try one more time. <laughs> OK, more or less convincing. Me. Ah. <coughs> Good. So um, this sort of explains a little conundrum, actually. That so, if you think of the flute and the clarinet, so those are the two sort of orchestral instruments that are both roughly cylindrical, in which you might apply this theory. So, and they're both about the same length. So a flute, I looked it up, a flute is about 66 centimeters long. And so if I look at what the fundamental, the lowest note that a flute can play is, uh, so it's open at both ends because you blow across the mouthpiece. So it's open at this end and of course it's open at that end. So that's an open pipe. The, I have uh, a fundamental mode which is half a wavelength. So that tells me that the wavelength should be twice of 66 centimeters. The speed of sound in air is about 340, so that gets me to 257 hertz, which is about middle C. And I think that is the lowest note that a flute can play. I don't know if there are any flautists in the audience. A clarinet, on the other hand, it's about the same length, slightly shorter, 60 centimeters, but it has a reed at this end and no opening. So you, 
the, uh, it's effectively a closed pipe at this end. All the air comes out this end. And that tells me that it's behaving like a closed pipe. So for the fundamental, the wavelength should be four times the length, not twice the length. And so four times the length gets me to roughly half this frequency, which is about an octave lower. I think it gets down to D rather than C3. So the clarinet is about the same length as the flute, but it's actually uh, an octave lower. All right, what does this have to do with vacuum cleaners? So the... These resonant cavities, like my tin whistle, so if I stimulate them, they can produce sound. But if I, if I have sound already, then they can take it away. So they, you can use them to get rid of noise as well as to generate noise. And, and they are used quite often in that way. So imagine this is a sort of schematic of how you might want to use one. So I have some uh, piece of equipment which typically has a fan or something at some end. Fans are noisy and it generates some regular, um, some noise with a, with a particularly known frequency. So I have some noise, this is my wave coming along this pipe, and I'd like to get rid of it. So one way to do that is to, is to stick a little uh, clarinet or something similar off the side of your pipe. And so this cavity here will have resonant modes, and we've seen that the, the resonant, the mode the wavelengths at which they will resonate. Well, the fundamental one is, is the wavelength is four times the length of the cavity, and then the first harmonic is a third of that, and then the next harmonic is a fifth of that, etc. So if I, if I match the, the wavelength, the frequency of you know, uh, the wavelength of the incoming uh, sound to one of these modes, then the cavity will resonate, and it'll suck that energy out of the incoming wave, and I won't get anything out of my outlet. And typically, you want these things to be as small as possible. And so you choose the fundamental. And so for the fundamental, the length should be a quarter of the incoming uh, wave length. And that tells you that, uh, so that's where the name uh, quarter wavelength resonator comes from. So let me just give you a, a, a schematic idea of how this thing is working, uh, one way to think about it. So you imagine you have, I have my wave coming along here. And when it hits this cavity, some of it is going to go down. So as my wave comes along, some of it goes down. The one on the top keeps going. The one here bounces from the bottom and comes back up again and then meets the one that was coming along the top. Now, the one that went down, it went down a quarter of a wavelength, and then it came up a quarter of a wavelength. So it's gone a half a wavelength altogether. And so when it gets back to the top, it's exactly out of phase with the one that was coming. So whereas the one that's coming has now got a trough, and this one's got a peak, and vice versa. And so they destructively interfere, and they cancel each other out, and it gets rid of the noise for you. Um, so the problem is that one problem is very great for getting rid of high-frequency noise, because you only need short cavities. But you don't really want a clarinet stuck on the end of your vacuum cleaner. So it's not so good for getting rid of low-frequency noise. And so I want to tell you about an idea that colleagues had in order to use this idea to reduce the frequency of which you could get uh, this idea to work for. Uh, but to do that, I have to first take a turn into left field and tell you about invisibility cloaks. I realize we're making this slide. It's really hard to illustrate an invisibility cloak. <laughs> Here's one that I drew earlier, me demonstrating. Fortunately, everybody knows what I mean when I say invisibility cloak. Uh, there's, uh, this is what they are according to Hollywood. Um, and so this is what I would mean mathematically by an invisibility cloak. So I have some sound wave coming in. The, the uh, red here is the low pressure. That's what was white before. So I have some wave coming in. I have something in the white here is the thing that I want to shield. And uh, the light blue here is the cloak. That's the thing that I'm, uh, I'm going to produce in order to shield what's inside. And what I would like to happen is that when the wave has come all the way through here, it looks like, uh, it looks like nothing happened. Right? The wave back here looks as though there was nothing in between. And if that's true, then uh, any person listening or if it was, sound, if it was uh, light looking here would see it as though it just passed straight through. 
Okay. How might you get that to happen? Well, you want to design your cloak in such a way that if you're thinking in terms of light, that the light coming in gets to the cloak and then it bends around, around your object, comes back together and goes off again. And if you could do that, then somebody, somebody stood here would see st stuff here as though there was nothing in between. It's like the old um, periscopes you just had with a kid where you, you reflect off a mirror and back, you can imagine doing it. This is a similar sort of idea. So, but bending light sounds like a strange phenomenon, but in fact, we're all used to light bending. Uh, you, you've all seen it at some stage. So this is, uh, this is a hot day with a tarmac road, and you, you see this mirage here where it looks like there's water on the road. Uh, of course, you know there isn't any water because you've all been up there and there's no puddle by the time you get there. And this is just, uh, it's again, it's a bending of the light. What's happening is that uh, the road gets very hot, so the air near the road is hotter than the air above. And, and so the hot air gets less dense. And as the light goes from a high density to a low density region, that causes it to bend. And so the light that's coming down here bends and actually ends up coming up into your eyes. And so what you see is your brain always thinks of light going in straight lines, of course. So your brain thinks that this light came from some point down here. So you see a picture of, in this case, the camel, or on the previous slide, the car. You see it upside down on the road. And then your brain thinks, I know there's not a car upside down on the road there. It thinks the only, the only way I can make sense of that is if there was some mirror there, because I know that when light bounces off a mirror, that's what it does. And then your brain says, I know there's not a mirror on the road, but if there was water on the road, it would behave in the same way. So your brain has made quite a few connections there to rationalize this upside down image into something that it can make sense of. So I have to bend the light. Uh, so this is one way that you could imagine doing that. How can I construct something that would bend the light in that way? So imagine here I take a, a grid of coordinates, just taken my, a grid of my um, x and y directions, I've chosen a point in the middle, and I'm going to stretch this out. I'm going to stretch my coordinates and expand that point until it's a circle. Okay? So, I've got a map now from this is my undeformed state, and this is my stretch state where I've taken a point and I've opened it out so I can hide something inside it. So the, the bit where it's transformed here, you see out uh, far away here, I haven't changed anything. I only transformed it locally. That's going to be my um, invisibility shield. So the, I've shaded the region here where the deformation is happening, and that corresponds to this region over here before I did the deformation. So I have some, I have some map that tells me how to expand this hole into this region, and this blue region here becomes this region here. And then I imagine if I had my sound wave or my light wave propagating on this side, well, there is nothing on this side. There's just this point that I'm going to expand, but that's not going to do anything. So the light carries on on that side as if nothing has happened. Perfectly happy. And then I imagine, so I use this map to say, well, what's the wave going to look like over here? Okay. So I take the point here, I work out where did it go to, and then I map it down here. And so this map, as I stretch it out, will turn this picture into this picture. So if I could arrange for this picture to be what happens, then I'd be in good shape because the, the wave is coming along here. I haven't moved the wave back here at all. Right? It's exactly what it was, what it would have been. So this, if I can do this, then uh, my invisibility will be working. So that's step one, is to imagine this expansion and mapping this wave. Step two is to think, all right, instead of just taking the answer here and using the map and working out what it becomes, let me work out what equation is the wave satisfying here and what happens to that equation when I do this transformation. So, so let me, so I'm going to show you an equation now. Don't be too scared. You don't have to understand it. You just have to know that it exists. Okay, so there is some equation over here that looks relatively simple. 
And when you do this transformation, you get some equation over here which looks a lot less simple. Um, so if there are A-level math students in the room, so that the upside down triangles here are derivatives, and the, all, all the extra mess you get in here is just from applying the chain rule after this transformation of variables. It's not so important exactly what this looks like, just that you can do it. And so in principle, if I now solve this equation, I should get the same answer. Because it doesn't matter if I solve and then map, or if I map, if, uh, or if I just solve the uh, map first and then solve. And in fact, that's true. So this is what the wave would look like if there was no circle. This is what it would look like if you solve the wave hitting the circle, just to show you that you get a reflected wave and you get a, sh a shadow behind here, and it looks very different. And this is what happens if you, show, if you solve that transformed equation. So you get a disturbance in the shield, but by the time you get out the back, everything is going along nicely again. OK, so that was step two. There are three steps. The third step is to think, all right, all I've done is mathematical manipulation so far. How would I actually build it physically? And to do that, you, you have to look at this equation and say, all right, suppose I had a, a, a material in here. And suppose I, I told you the sound speed depends on the compressibility and on the density. So this is what the equation would look like for a material where I'm varying the compressibility and the density. So this is the reason I had to show you the equations. All you have to do now is say, how do I make this into this? Or how do I make this into this? If I could choose the density to be this thing here, then that material would behave as a perfect clock. I've got the, I've got the formula that tells me what material I should construct. Unfortunately, uh, it's not so easy to do that because uh, we're used to thinking of density as just being a number. And that, for the mathematicians, this thing up here is a matrix. So what does that mean? That means that the density of the air is different if the wave is going in that direction or that direction. Or if you, th if you like to think of it in terms of particles, it means the mass of a particle is different depending on which direction it wants to go in. Crazy. It, uh, how can it be possible? Uh, so it is a crazy idea. and. But, but it's not impossible. And to explain why it's not impossible, I have to go to my other um, subject, which was metamaterials. And that's the idea that if, if you mix together two materials, the resulting mixture can have some quite strange properties uh, compared to the original material. So let me give you an example of that. So we're talking about uh, sound waves. So let me think about, I told you the speed of sound in air is about 340, 343 meters per second. The speed of sound in water is a bit more. It's about 1,500 meters per second. What about if I have a few air bubbles in my water? So what's the speed of sound in bubbly water? That's my mixture of materials. So let me draw a graph. So this is the speed of sound on the vertical axis. This is the volume fraction of air. So if I'm here, I've got no air. I'm pure water, so it's 1,500. If I'm at this end, then I'm completely air, so it's 340. You might imagine that if I've got a 50-50 mixture of water and air, then I should just take the average of these two and draw a straight line between them. But you'd be very wrong. So the actual sound speed of bubbly water looks something like this. So not only is it not the average, for almost all volume fractions, it's much less than either the pure water or the pure air. It's, it's, I mean, it gets, down, you, it gets down so you can't really see what number I've got to. If I zoom in a bit, it gets down to about 30, almost walking speed. So why is that happening? How is it possible? And it's all to do with, with how you average. So let me, I told you that this, the speed of sound was, um, the square of the speed of sound is 1 over the compressibility times the density. So the first thing is that you, shouldn't, you should really think of this the other way up that the, it's 1 over the speed of sound squared is compressibility times density. And then it turns out that it, it's not right to average the product. What you should do is do the average of the individuals and then multiply them together. And so it's not obvious why that's the right thing to do, but it turns out it is the right thing to do. And 
these materials are actually quite different. So if you look, the density of water is about a thousand times the density of air. So when you're averaging a bit of water and a bit of air, it basically looks like water, as far as the density is concerned. But the compressibility of air is about 10,000 times the compressibility of water. So when you average a bit of water and a bit of air, as far as compressibility is concerned, it basically looks like air. So you have a material which has the density of water, but the compressibility of air. And that means that each of these averages is, is way bigger than, than you might expect, and that means the speed of sound is way lower than you would expect. So by mixing together two materials, you've got a material which, uh, which is not at all like either of the individual materials. It's very different. What about anisotropy? So I said you have different things in different directions. Well, now you've got this idea of mixing materials. It's not so hard to think, well, if my, if my air bubbles were not little circles or uh, spheres, but they were stretched in some way, so in particular, I might have these ellipses here. It's not such a, such a wild thing to think that a wave propagating in this direction is going to behave differently to a wave propagating in that direction. And so you can get this anisotropic behavior by having this microstructured material where you, you have some, uh, some non-symmetric shape locally, and that gives you this different propagation in different directions. All right, what's it got to do with vacuum cleaners? So these uh, colleagues up in Manchester and, and Cambridge, uh, Will Parnell's group, they were working with Dyson on vacuum cleaners, and they had this idea to use these same sort of transformational approach to quarter wavelength resonators. So you want to make them smaller. So what about if you, you want something that the sound wave thinks it's this big, but you only want to make it this big? So you could use the same idea. You say, I'm going to map this shape into this shape. And then I'm going to say, right, what properties does the material in here have to have in order that the sound thinks it's really this shape? And so they solved that problem. And, and they came up with a microstructure. Now, it's very hard to put, uh, uh, you can't put bubbles and structure them, but you can put baffles in. So what they did was they, they took this quarter wavelength resonator, they worked out what it had to be, and then they put some baffles in. Uh, here, they're very stretched ellipses, and they, they tried two different things, one putting in, them in the middle and one putting them on the edges with a gap between them. And of course, these days, you have a mathematical idea, it's very easy to test, you just go 3D print it. And so here's some 3D printed quarter wavelength resonators, and you can see the, the elliptical baffle in here, and likewise those in there. And they'd designed this microstructure so that it, the sound would think it was twice as long as it was. And so they can therefore get the same uh, energy, uh, same wavelength of energy out of the, um, out of the incoming uh, sound with half the length of the effective resonator. And then they did some experiments. So this is, this is the channel along which the sound wave is going, and here's their their quarter wavelength resonator stuck on the top. And here's one that didn't have the baffles in. And that, uh, this is where it's taking energy out of the system. So it's uh, sort of the equivalent of, of what's happening on my phone there. And this one was taking it out around about 2,000 hertz if you didn't have any baffles in there. But when they put the baffles in, they found that this peak dropped down to around about 1,000, which is what they designed it to be, it should take energy out about a half the frequency. And they found that the green one works slightly better than the red one. Right, I'm coming to a close. I wanted to show you one more example of, um, of uh, waves and resonance. And it's, it's sort of related going back to strings, but it's to do with metal sheets. So if I have a sheet of metal, it will also support transverse waves. Um, but metal is different to a string. A string I have to stretch tight between uh, two endpoints, so it's always sort of flat, whereas a sheet of metal I can bend. And what you find is that uh, if you bend it a little bit, then the waves will propagate. But if you bend it a lot, then you can't get waves on it anymore. 
And so effectively, the speed of sound depends on the curvature, how much you've bent the weight. And what that means is if you take a piece of metal and you bend it into an S-shape, then an S-shape has high curvature here and high curvature here, but very low curvature in between. So you get a region where waves will propagate in between the two high, region, high curvature regions, but they won't propagate past, past this point or past that point. And now you're in a situation which is very much like the guitar string. So the wave is confined to these regions. It'll shuttle back and forwards. Effectively, I'll set up my eigenmodes with these two things at the end as the, as the length of the string. In this case, the, the length of the sheet. And as I change how much it's bent, I can move these points around, and that will change the frequency of the note that I get out of it. So I've always wanted to do this, so I'm going to give you a demonstration of this. Um, but if it all goes horribly wrong, bear with me, because I'm not a violinist. So I might get it all wrong. I would say don't try this at home, but in fact, I think you should try this at home. You should just be careful when you do it. <laughs> so this is a saw that I just borrowed from my garden shed. You can see it's a, little, it's a bit uh, rusty, so it's not very carefully chosen. But let's hope this works. If I bend it into an S shape, you can get a note out of it. I'm amazed at how good a note you can get out of a rusty old saw like that. Um, let me close by showing you, showing you somebody who can really play this thing. So this is, this is something I got from the internet. Her soul's a bit longer than mine. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you. <laughs>